Greetings, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this Q&A with um, director and filmmaker Desmond Oviagali, whose film The Milkmaid is currently screening as part of the 28th New York African Film Festival. And I'm Ngozi Odita. I'm founder of Africa Next, and we curate spaces and experiences for those passionate about um, Africa to connect. So hello, Desmond. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, hello, Ngozi. And again, I just wanted to like really thank you for this film. Like, you know, I, I was saying earlier when we were talking, like, I just really love the film, the story arc. Um, it was visually stunning, but it was, it was, a, it was an important story that was told very well. And um, I appreciated it. I loved it. So yeah. thank you for giving us um, The Milkmaid. So um, the, the film is about insurgency in the North. And um, for like, a, there's kind of like a connotation of what that is. Like people think of it as it's such this tragic story, which it is. And there's so much, you know, like films or documentaries show you all the tragedies that are happening, you know, you know, in, the, in Northern Nigeria. But for you, like your approach with the, the, um, the Milkmaid is you have these two sisters, Aisha and Zainab, and you know, they're kidnapped from their village by religious extremists. But rather than kind of depicting them as just these victims who go through all these tragic things, there was more complexity to the story. And you really showed that they were, you know, like they, 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 were, pow they were powerful, they had agencies, they had their own ideas and opinions. So why did you choose to like take that um, angle of the movie and depict them in that way? Um, it wasn't a conscious decision on my part that uh, Aisha and Zainab wouldn't be portrayed as victims of the milkmaid. I think that was probably a decision that came out of the research I had done and my personal encounter uh, with the survival of insurgency, who I encountered in the southern part of the country in Lagos, not far from where I actually live, and having interacted uh, with these couple of women. I mean, the most striking thing about them was that, you know, um, they had the most horrific stories to tell about where they came from and how many members of their family they had lost, you know. Uh, but, you know, they were still standing on their two feet. They were still, to some extent, smiling. Uh, they were upright. They weren't bent over and, you know, feeling sorry for themselves. So it was, it was very striking that, you know, these women had been through so much, you know, but yet, you know, they had found a way to survive. And that wasn't automatic. I mean, they literally had to look for, you know, loopholes in the security apparatus of the people who abducted them in the camp and make their escape. And not just make their escape, make their way all the way down from northern Nigeria to southern Nigeria uh, to seek refuge, you know, from, from the crisis. So uh, that told me that, you know, these uh, the victims, uh, you know, do to some extent have a degree of agency uh, in terms of their fate, in terms of their destiny, and some of them do take their destiny into their own hands, you know, to find a solution out of out of their dilemma. So um, uh, that's what we 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 sought to portray with Aisha and Zena, which is yes, they have been abducted, they don't have guns, they're not more physically powerful than their doctors, but. You know, they're, they're still able to use their wits to find a way to survive in this very, very new and hostile situation in which they find themselves. I think also a part of it that um, I saw is like even not just with the, the young women who were um, kind of the central characters, but even with the soldiers, you were able to like I developed like like feelings, like I had compassion towards the soldier's experience. And many people would just be like, they're bad, like they, but you you were able to show like, there's more to this story. You like went beneath the surface and you gave the show, you, you showed a perspective and like kind of an angle to what the experience is of a soldier as well. So why was that important to incorporate into the story? Uh, again, that was um, a decision to portray them as the research bore out. I mean, it was very interesting, you know, reading uh, the accounts of survivors, uh, you know, of the insurgency and uh, them talking about how their doctors related to them. And 
you know, it reminded one that, you know, the people who are perpetrators in the insurgency crisis uh, weren't born perpetrators or born normal human beings who went about their lives playing and laughing and joking. And along the way, they got uh, brainwashed into an extremist ideology, but they still retain uh, elements of humanity. And that certainly uh, proved itself when the girls came to very close contact with these people after being abducted. And, you know, these people uh, tended to want the girls just by the fact that they had coerced them uh, to be with them. They wanted them to like them and made efforts to try and make them like them. You know, they wanted romantic relationships rather than, uh, you know, master servant, uh, which is uh, probably what some people might think, you know, from uh, uh, from reports. But, uh, you know, so they actually made attempts to win them over and not necessarily coerce them. Yes, coercion was a part of their ideology, but, you know, they, they, they tried to buy them expensive things and gifts uh, even imports of food items from outside the country, from Dubai and such places, uh, jewelry as well. Uh, this was the stories that you know some of the uh, survivors told. You know, so um, you know they, they have uh, their extremist ideology. They also have uh, human elements and aspirations to them, and we we try to show that uh, through uh, some of the uh, insurgent leaders in the milkway that. Uh, uh, one of the reasons why their, their brainwashing and indoctrination is so successful is that they're able to cover their victims from a human point of view, uh, to show them that, hey, we're human beings like yourselves, and we've just discovered these new lights that you also need to be a part of. So it even makes uh, their extremism even more seductive. Um, unfortunately, it's also, to some extent, successful, uh, you know, given the you know some of the people who have actually been won over through their ideology and have embarked on either, you know, uh, you know, um, uh, campaigns of, of killing uh, uh, through, you know, uh, uh, military action or even through suicide bombings. So you also, you talked about authenticity. So I'm sure many would be like, well, here's this man who's not Muslim, who's not from the North. Like, why, why does he tell this story? So can you also share, like, why did you feel like you were the right person to tell this story considering that and to tell the story authentically considering those things i didn't particularly feel that i necessarily was the right person to tell this story um as you know you may point out i'm not uh, i'm not from the northern part of nigeria i'm not a muslim uh, i'm not a woman but i'm, I'm telling a, a story that has these elements as very strong, as strongly represented in the film. Uh, what I did feel was that the right person to tell the story was someone who had the commitment to uh, tell as authentic a story as possible uh, to justify, uh, you know, the experiences and the trauma uh, that the victims of insurgency uh, experience. Uh, so that commitment, uh, I felt what was telling such a story needed to have that commitment to authenticity. And then I also felt the person, hopefully, you know, would have uh, the expertise, the skills to be able to tell it uh, in a way that was compelling and was persuasive and was impactful. Uh, now, uh, as to whether I qualify on the second part, that's obviously not for me to say, okay? you know, that's for other people to judge. Uh, but for the first part, I certainly did feel that I, I had the commitment uh, to tell that story as authentically as possible. And that was just simply because of the way I felt about the situation in the, in, in the northern part uh, of the country and the fact that very little was being said about it. It certainly wasn't being portrayed through the medium of film. Uh, the media reports tended to focus far more on the actions or inactions of the government, of the extremists themselves, there's very little attention uh, being given to the victims, who they were, their backstories, uh, just putting more flesh around who these people are rather than just how many people died and the number of people who died. So I, I certainly felt very strongly motivated, you know, to put the lives of the victims of insurgency, you know, uh, before the world, you know, to, to a certain extent, you know, we're not saying our film you know, uh, addresses every aspect, you know, of, of, of the victims of insurgency. But we certainly did try to portray 
you know, some of, you know, uh, their experiences and what they go through. And in addition to that, also what they, who the extremists are, you know, and, you know, how they think and how they relate, you know, to, um, uh, to, 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 to their captives, you know. So um, that essentially was, you know, my motivation for delving into the milkmaid. Uh, I did try to immerse myself in as much research as I could to ensure that the, the narrative that came out of that uh, research process uh, was um, was authentic to, to the characters involved in the setting of the story. So speaking of stories, let's talk about your story a little bit. You're an investment banker. So how does an investment banker end up getting into film? And then more importantly, like you've done two films and you've done them well. It's one thing to like say, I want to be a filmmaker, quite another thing to tell good stories. So what was it like, how did that journey happen? Like, and how did you become a good filmmaker considering that was not your background? It's not what you studied. I worked as an investment banker for several years. Um, although I would say there is, uh, there's, uh, there's a difference between working in investment banking and being an investment banker. I think I I'm probably still not sure that I was ever uh, fully an investment banker in true sense of the word in terms of being, you know, absolutely dialed in 100% uh, 24-7 uh, to that. I had other aspects of myself and my personality, which I was very keen to explore. And I guess at some point after several years in investment banking, I, I felt that if I didn't take that step to at least uh, explore that side of, of my personality, then it probably would never happen. So, uh, I stepped away from investment banking and uh, sought for a form of, you know, personal expression in the creative arts. Uh, perhaps uh, not, not a total sea change uh, for me, uh, given that uh, my mother happens to be uh, uh, a popular fiction writer in Nigeria, uh, you know, dating back, you know, for the last uh, 40 years or so. But uh, I, I never did have... Uh, any inkling that I would, you know, tow that path uh, until, you know, fa fa fairly, uh, fairly late in my, in my, in my adult life, so to speak. Um, so uh, once, once that happened, I, I, I didn't go to film school. Um, I, what I, I was inclined to do was just to watch as many films as possible. I enjoyed watching films the same way I enjoyed immersing myself in tons of novels as I was growing up as a youth. Uh, so uh, I gravitated more towards films uh, and I just sought to, uh, you know, just soak up, you know, how, how, how films are made, you know, dialogue, uh, characterization, storylines and all that. It was a very informal process, but I think it informed my approach to filmmaking uh, and sort of, you know, helped me to craft exactly how I want to develop and interpret the stories that I have uh, you know, in my mind. I started out writing scripts, which is actually my first uh, step into the filmmaking industry. And uh, I wrote several scripts, most of which haven't seen the light of day. Uh, but eventually I latched onto a script, which I felt, uh, I felt strongly enough about uh, to begin to put the elements of production in place in terms of financing, in terms of cast, in terms of crew. And that resulted in my first film render to season in 2014. Uh, and it took me a number of years to recover from that process, which was quite, well, it was a bit of a shock to the system. Uh, but once I did, then uh, the second story that uh, made me feel just as strong, if not stronger about what was a milkmaid. Uh, that's where we are. So how did you, how was it getting started? Because not going to film school, and I mean, obviously with your mother being a writer, there's that, but you still had to establish relationships. That so much of that is involved in being able to not just make a film, but get your film out there, get it into film festivals. So what was that process like um, in being able to accomplish that without coming from a film background? Um, one thing I certainly would say I, I benefited uh, from uh, working as uh, an investment banker was obviously uh, the training and the discipline and the tools 
that that uh, professional career uh, had provided to me in terms of being able to articulate uh, proposals and ideas and concepts uh, in, in, in a lucid form, uh, you know, to be consumed by a third party. So you're, you're able to put together your ideas uh, and the essence of them uh, in, a, in a compelling way that hopefully gets other people to, to subscribe, you know, to what you're doing. Uh, that obviously was a strong part of, uh, of my job as an investment banker in terms of raising financing for my clients. And that was certainly something I leaned on considerably in terms of uh, articulating what I wanted to do as a filmmaker and, uh, you, know, you know, putting that in a format uh, that was, you know, conducive uh, for, for people to invest in my film, not just invest in my film, but also to be a part of the film as, as cast members, as crew members, and, and various other members of, of the production. So um, I was able to, I guess in a way, just, uh, you know, uh, package uh, uh, myself and, and my stories and my projects uh, in a way that, uh, you know, people um, uh, wanted to be a part of, you know, realizing uh, those projects. Um, so, so, yeah, the investment banking experience was certainly very useful for me uh, in that respect. And, uh, helped to compensate for the fact that I was uh, a newbie in the filmmaking industry. I didn't really know people. I didn't know anybody at all. But uh, just the fact that I was able to use those tools and that experience to present uh, my projects in you know what I hope was a professional manner was certainly very helpful to me in, in making traction with uh, with my projects. So fast forwarding back to now and the milkmaid is out it's been you know screening at festivals now it's going to screen um with the new york african film festival but it was also um nigeria's entry for the oscars so how do you feel like how do you feel about that like i know the country was very excited i'm excited but like how do you feel about that you know that whole process and like what are your hopes that may come out of it whether you win or not um, obviously, the milkmaid being selected to represent Nigeria at the 93rd Oscars, yeah, I mean, to use the cliche, it's a dream come true, obviously. I mean, uh, we have a country of 200 million people, we have a very thriving film industry, uh, probably the most prolific film industry in the world by a sheer volume of output. And for, for, for our film to have been selected from, you know, some, some very sterling competition. Uh, to represent uh, the country is extremely gratifying. It's very humbling. Uh, absolutely, I, I don't think I've truly processed it yet. I think once all the, the various announcements have been done, and I can probably sit back and appreciate, you know, what uh, what an honor it was or is, you know, for us to be representing the country. Uh, but you know, particularly for my cast and crew who really put in heart and soul into this project. We're shooting this project for three months in the northern east, eastern part of the country in Tarabo State, which itself is part of the uh, theater of conflict or of insurgency. Uh, so it was certainly not without risk, uh, but uh, the men and the women who put their shoulders to the burden, you know, they didn't flinch. They went through hell and high water to get this project made or moved uh, by uh, by the story and the opportunity to give a voice, you know, to those who don't have a voice to speak for themselves uh, as victims of insurgency. So uh, to have their efforts uh, re rewarded with such, uh, uh, you know, fantastic, uh, uh, you know, accolade is is really, really, really very gratifying. I'm, I'm so pleased that you know, they they have this as 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 a fruit of their endeavors and. Uh, in terms of what I expect going forward, where well, we have uh, well over 90 countries who have made submissions to the Academy uh, with wonderful films, uh, you know, high quality films. Uh, and, you know, um, it's a very competitive process as uh, all the other categories, uh, you know, outside of Best International Feature Film are, you know, for the Oscars. So uh, we can only hope and pray that, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, we make it you know beyond the preliminary stage making it through to the shortlist of 15 in february would be a, would be even more fantastic 
you know, for us as a production, you know, because obviously it's gratifying for us, you know, personally and professionally, but, uh, you know, it also helps us to meet our, our kind of objective, which is for our story and for the, for the lives of, of these people, you know, involved in, in the insurgency, you know, just not just in Nigeria, but in increasingly, unfortunately, in sub-Saharan Africa, you know, for the lives of these people to be seen and to, for their voices to be heard, you know, uh, for a longer period, you know, and that will happen if the film is shot listed and however far it gets, both in the Oscar process as well as in the festivals that the film is showing, you know, is just, you know, uh, you know, more traction, more visibility, more mileage, you know, for the situation and hopefully, you know, for interventions uh, to come on behalf of those who are affected by the insurgency. So, um, yeah, that's where we are. We're just hoping that our film can be seen as widely as possible. You know, and that the people involved in these situations can get the attention that they truly deserve. Similar to what the Chibox girls got in 2014 after the abduction, but the characters we have in the milkmaid are not necessarily of the demographic of the Chibok girls who are uh, young and educated. I mean, uh, the, 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 the victims of insurgency cut across men and women, young and old, and are typically not educated, are similar to the lead characters of the milkmaid. Uh, that people just eking out an existence uh, through farming, uh, through cattle herding, uh, through some form of petty trading, you know, and their lives get disrupted by these violent activities. So, um, you know, hopefully we can bring the, the consciousness of their stories and their lives to the world. And it's, I, I love that you mentioned like the crew like the people behind the cameras and the whole team. Cause often like with the Oscars or just any recognition, you just know of like the filmmaker. You're like, oh, the filmmaker, the director, that's who everyone talks about. But there's a whole crew behind the scenes that make it happen. So I think it's great that you acknowledge them. And just like the imagery, like there, it can't, it doesn't take, one person cannot do that. Like I saw like some still um, photos from the film and they were just amazing. And that means there's a photographer there that had to take those pictures so that we, you know, that they, they could be shared. So it was like a, a whole production crew, <laughs> obviously that does it, that made it come to this point. So it was just, yeah, it was just amazing. So um, I have some like fun rapid fire questions for you. So my first one is about um, Shihu. So you have this character who wears a mask the whole time of the film. And I picked up on that. And in my mind, I was like, okay, I need to know the character development behind this. Cause you don't tell us why in the film, but he just never removes the mask. So what's the story behind that? Um, the Milkmaid wasn't based on any one person's particular story. As I mentioned before, it was a product of you know, wide, uh, wide research you know, across uh, so many uh, victims in several territories uh, uh, in the northern eastern part of, of Nigeria where the conflict is taking place. Uh, but uh, uh, quite, quite a number of the scenarios were predicated on real life experiences uh, narrated by my survivors and, and one, of, one of the one of the accounts that I found intriguing uh, given my survival was the fact that you know, after being abducted you know from a village and taken to the camp of resurgence she was forcibly married to this character uh, who was one of the uh, um, top uh, lieutenants in the insurgency movement uh, but who very idiosyncratically, never took off his mask. He wore his mask even to bed, uh, wow. in, in the bedroom. And she, she, she de despite uh, the obvious trauma uh, that she was going through and faced, uh, still found it quite intriguing that, you know, who on earth is this person that, you know, even on like the rest of his, uh, uh, you know, um, colleagues in, in the movement, you know, never took off his mask, wore his mask all the time. So I thought that, would be an interesting character uh, to portray visually in the film, you know, even though he doesn't really say anything. But uh, just a notion that, you know, such was his devotion to the cause, you know, that, uh, you know, he felt he needed to, uh, uh, to wear a mask all the time. Perhaps uh, you could say he was, you know, uh, you know not, not entirely comfortable with what he was doing and people seeing who he was doing what he was doing. But, you know, who knows, that's uh, you know, probably entering into Freudian 
our territory here. But that, that, that's a story about the guy with the mask. Wow. You did say like a lot of the accounts are real stories that would, were told to you. So it goes back to the whole authenticity and ensuring that like kind of the voices in the storyline come out in the film, although it's a fictional film, it's, it's, it's very true to what actually happened, which was really great. So um, you were filming in the North. Tell us what were either Fulani or house of dishes? Like what were some, cause that's not where you're from. So I'm sure you tried like new foods. Was there anything that you were like this? I love this particular thing. What foods did I come across in the process of shooting in the North that I liked? One dish that I liked particularly uh, happened to be uh, one of the most common dishes, particularly for breakfast. Uh, prepared in the north is consumed widely and much loved. It's called fura danono, uh, and it's essentially uh, it's it's boiled or cooked millet balls uh, crushed into a bowl of sweet yogurt. Uh, you actually see one of the characters preparing it in the film, and that was deliberate because I liked it so much. Uh, I felt I needed you know people to be a part of. You know what I liked, uh, but more than that, uh, it actually is what a Fulani milkmaid sells. I mean, that's her livelihood. Apart from nono, which is milk, uh, and which is very rich milk, which she also sells to drink. Uh, what she sells for her customers to consume to eat is actually a bowl of Fulani nono. It's very delicious. I can recommend it highly to anybody who is visiting another part of the country or who has access to. Uh, that food in some Nigerian restaurants somewhere around the world. For the Nono is absolutely delicious. I 100% guarantee it and recommend it for consumption. Uh, the other food uh, that I did like, there was a, a dish called masa. And masa effectively uh, fried rice cakes. Uh, so they actually happen to look like pancakes, a bit thicker. Uh, but also very delicious. Uh, you typically eat them. Uh, uh, they're actually made with uh, with rice uh, mixed with, uh, I believe, eggs as well, and it's all you know, uh, you know, converted into some form of batter and fried, and it's delicious like pancakes. As I said, you eat them with some sort of broth or with gravy or with syrup. But again, absolutely fantastic, and would recommend that highly to anyone who wanted a taste. Of, of of northern cuisine yeah nice okay now i'm like the next time in nigeria i have to go looking for um those particular um those two particular things okay so what is your favorite film that you found inspiration from or that you just love you can only pick one only one <laughs> wow well, that's a tough one i will probably have to beat if a, a well-trodden path Perhaps a bit boring because it's been heard so many times, but I'll probably have to say it's the Godfather. For me, the Godfather was, you know, a perfect storm in terms of everything, you know, just working, everything coming into place at a very high level of excellence. Uh, the acting, the characterizations, the story, the music, uh, phenomenal performance by Marlon Brando, the, you know, the lead character. Um, so, I mean, The Godfather for me just ticked all the boxes. It's an epic film. I like epic films. Uh, I think Milk Maze isn't too short either in terms of running time. Uh, but yeah, I mean, for me, The Godfather was just a film that, you know, was very inspirational, just, just in terms of fantastic writing, you know, adapted from a very popular novel uh, and obviously deserves all the accolades and continuing. Uh, attention that it continues to get. So it's a, it's a monumental achievement in filmmaking, uh, in my opinion, and uh, also it's something that inspired me and continues to inspire me to, to do better in what I do. Um, I think I also read somewhere that you like Quentin Tarantino. Did I read that somewhere, that you like Quentin Tarantino? Yes, certainly. Uh, Quentin Tarantino's style of filmmaking uh, is a style that I did uh, draw some inspiration from, uh, particularly in, uh, in, in, the, in the context of uh, the non-linear uh, structure 
of, of some of these films, uh, which uh, we, 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 we used uh, with the milkmaid. And, uh... I was going to mention that because I was like, okay, I think I read that. And I noticed in the film that you do that, like you kind of go back and forth between time. Yeah. I think the sense of that was uh, we did have a lot to tell in terms of the characters, where they were going to, and not just where they were going to, but where they were coming from. And I we found that structure uh, helpful to that uh, in that regard. Uh, but also, we, we we wanted the audience to perhaps not be uh, spoon fed. We wanted them to perhaps uh, work a bit for the information that they received. Uh, hopefully, they didn't have to work too hard. If they did, I apologize for that. But yeah, that was certainly a creative decision that uh, was inspired by some uh, Quentin Tarantino films that, that I had watched. Because there was, I, after I watched the film, I was like, wait, I don't, some, I, I missed something. I, I think I missed something. So then when I went back, I was like, oh, okay, that particular time it went back and then came forward. So I had to watch it twice so I can like be like, oh, okay, now I got it. Um, but watching it twice did not matter. Like I could probably watch it a third and fourth time because it was so good. Um, so what are, if you can, what are some words of wisdom that were imparted to you that kind of stick with you? Uh, two words come to mind uh, that I carry around with me uh, uh, with, in, in filmmaking. And the first one is be positive. Uh, never rule out what can be done. You know, uh, you know life can can be intimidated in terms of trying to limit the scope of um, of your vision, and you can never you can never tell what will happen. I think it's very important. I found it very important for me to remain positive, even in spite of you know daunting obstacles and things. And and you know uh, the milkmaid for me was certainly an example of that. Several times during the course of production, uh, wondering how on earth you know, certain story elements are going to be achieved. And one way or the other, they were achieved. They were, even when one was tempted to, you know, perhaps remove them from the script or change them or do this or that, you know, they, they, they came through. Uh, but they only came through because somehow or the other, you know, we endeavored to, to remain positive about what we were doing. So that's one. And then the second thing is uh, to be adaptive because when the things you're trying to be positive about, uh, totally fall down flat and can't happen, then you're going to have to switch to plan B uh, and still, you know, as they say, the show must continue, you know, so uh, just trying to be adaptive in the face of, you know, developments that haven't worked out anywhere near uh, the way you hope they'll work out, but still trying to remain true uh, to the original vision, you know, so uh, for me personally, be positive and be adaptive. So what would be one thing, if, if you wanted one thing that people could take away from this film, having watched it and to leave the theater, or now that a lot of people are at home, like to once the movie has finished, what do you want them to take away from it? Um, there are a number of things, uh, naturally, that I'd like people to take away from watching a movie. But well, certainly one thing that does stand out for me is the concept of the resilience of the human spirit. And that was certainly something that I found very striking in interacting, you know, with a couple of people who were involved in that situation and then reading far much more about uh, uh, the accounts of survivors. And the fact that, you know, Africans, you know, African women in particular, particularly in the context of this story, are extremely, amazingly resilient. You know, uh, I mean, they, 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 so many of them could easily have had mental breakdowns, uh, you know, based on what they passed through, what they went through. But, uh, you know, through thick and thin, through hell and high water, through the storm, uh, they, they're still with us to this day. You know, their lives are nowhere near, you know, how they were living before they were attacked. Uh, their lives are currently broken, currently disrupted. So certainly, in economically, they are devastated, and you know probably you know, to some extent emotionally and psychologically as well. But notwithstanding all that, they still push on. They still strive on. They're still looking for a foot up, you know, or a foot back, 
into where they were, you know, as human beings. And, you know, um, I'd like people to come away with that, you know, with the fact that these people have been victims of insurgency, but all they need is support, you know, and, you know, they can recover a modicum of, you know, what they used to be and how they used to be. But, you know, they do need support, you know, from the larger public. And if the public can come away with that, that, you know, uh, yes, they are victims, uh, but their cases are not totally hopeless. You know, th there's a foundation there emotionally and psychologically that can be built upon with the support of uh, of the wider society. So I'd like people to come away with that from the military. And secondly, although I know I was asked for just one thing, we should take away what, as I said, I have a number of things. And another important thing for me, uh, you know, that people hopefully should uh, can take away from the film is the fact that um, there really is not that thick a line between the perpetrators and the victims. It's really not as black and white as we expect or perhaps like to even like to think uh, because the perpetrators in several cases uh, started out as victims and along the continuum, there was a continuum that, uh, you know, they progressed along from being victims to becoming perpetrators uh, facilitated by indoctrination, facilitated by brainwashing. Uh, but but the fact is, uh, you know, it's not there's not there's not a hard divide between the two, and uh, victims, uh, you know, uh, have become perpetrators, uh, and you know, perpetrators, you know, do become victims at at some point, uh, you know. So, um, you know, it it just reminds us of the fact that uh, we need to be. Uh, very considered in terms of how we think about the victims, how we think about the perpetrators, so that you know we can uh, find the best way to to engage them, uh, because you know it's 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 not that difficult you know for one to cross over to the other side of the line you know, uh, and I think we 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 did try to uh, bring that out you know with the milkmaid and with the characters in the milkmaid you know uh, you know which actually is based on. You know, uh, you know, real life events and what has actually happened. Uh, you, you, you know, so uh, yeah, that's uh, that's certainly uh, another thing I'd like people to come away from from watching the Milk Maid. That's great. I didn't I didn't even think about that. Like, I thought a lot about Zainab and her journey, but then I didn't think about it the other way. And you just said that, like the fluidity, like it's on both sides. It's not just like one way. You'll have soldiers who come to a different understanding, then you'll have the women who have another understanding. So that's so important and so um, reflective of life in general. And I think that was one of the wonderful things about The Milkmaid, like it was so relatable to life. Like you saw the things you struggle with in Aisha's story. And then you can look at the God and, and understand his journey and struggling with things because it's just part of a human process. So. And an example, you know, from uh, the milkmaid, obviously, is the the journey of Zena. I mean, you know, you have here a young, sweet, innocent girl who, you know, is not very powerful, living her life in the village. You know, she's the younger sister, you know, so, you know, she even has less of a say, you know, by virtue of her position of birth. But all of a sudden, due to the circumstances that they found themselves in, uh, she found a path to a level of authority and power that she had never experienced in her life before. And, you know, that was very tempting and that was very seductive, you know, for her. And obviously was a key element in her in, in her transition, you know, in the film, you know, and, and that comes out of real life. You know, uh, some of these people, uh, you know, uh, the, the perpetrators started out as the underprivileged, you know, the downtrodden in society, you know, who, uh, you know, no one, you know, cast a second look at. And all of a sudden, by virtue of this movement, they were afforded positions of influence, of power, of authority, uh, both male and female. Uh, and, you know, some found that, you know, too, uh, too, too attractive to resist and essentially crossed the line to become who they became, you know. So that's 
again something that uh, you know we um, we sought to portray you know you know with the film. Yeah, an evolution. I feel like every the three main characters evolved in a variety of ways throughout the entire film. Like it wasn't like nothing was as you expected it from the beginning. It did not end as you would expect it. And it just showed you like just life, the trajectory of life. Like there's so many things that change and you end up places you never thought you would end up. And you did a really good job of like showing that journey and taking us on that journey. So thank you. Thank you, Desmond, for your time today. Amazing film. Fingers crossed for the Oscars, but even if that doesn't happen, you've put something beautiful in the world. And I think that many people will appreciate it. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ngozi. Thank you very much for this interview.